All right, good morning, Faith Endeavor. Good morning, Faith Endeavor. All right, Happy New Year. All right, and this is a great, uh, this is a great way to go ahead and, um, and obviously start 2020 off uh, in the house of the Lord with uh, the people of God. And so uh, never take this for granted, man. Never take this for granted. This is a privilege for us, especially, um, you know, just, just being alive, being born at this specific time um, in America, having the freedom to open up this Bible, to go ahead and talk about Jesus. Um, a lot of people uh, did not wake up to that privilege today. So please, let's not look over that. Uh, so let me go ahead and pray. Um, dive into this text today. And uh, let's go ahead and hear what the Lord has to say. So, Heavenly Father, um, we come to you um, knowing that uh, if we were just coming on our own accord, oh God, you would not listen to a word we have to say. Uh, because apart from your Holy Spirit, uh, there isn't anything within us that wants to go ahead and dialogue with you or care about your will, oh God. We, we want to go ahead and do us. Um, uh, we want church on our terms. We want things to be flashy, um, uh, cool. And, and, and Lord, we miss the point when that happens. And that's your son, Jesus. Uh, so today, I ask that every single person in this room um, can go ahead and, and, and realize who you are, God, in a real deep way. Uh, Holy Spirit, will you please go ahead and, and go before every single word I say. Touch the hearts of every man and woman in this room. Um, uh, oh, touch my heart, oh God. Uh, any, any blind spots that we have that we are not seeing, will you please go ahead, um, reveal that to us so that we go ahead and come to know you more. And that's uh, that's the ultimate goal, God, that your people will go ahead and look more and more like your son every single day. Uh, we thank you for that gift, Jesus, and um, please bless this word in your heavenly name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, so 2020 has been starting off, and I know we have a lot of, um, you know, goals this year. So one thing, one of the most popular uh, goals, especially in, in Christianity, is like, man, you know what, this year I'm going to go and read the Bible from front to back, Right? January 1st, I'm going to start off with Genesis 1, and I'm going to go ahead and start moving. And how have we been doing with that? We probably haven't even really even started. But just let's just toss this out. How have we been doing with our Bible reading uh, periods in our Christian walk? Um, have we been, you know, diving into the Word? Have we really been studying? Have we really been meditating on what God has, has given us, has preserved us? This, this book right here, um, probably not. Uh, Barna, a Christian statistical website, check check this out. Forty five percent of millennials. I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm one year over. If I hope this that I don't want to be a part of this. So hopefully I'm not a millennial. But forty five percent of millennials, check this out. Say they don't read or need to read the Bible daily because they already know the main stories. Right. So you you think about it, Abraham, Moses. The birth of Jesus, miracles, Ten Commandments. These stories are already known by all of us, right? Like, you go ahead and ask me, yeah, I know about that story. Of course, I, like, like, who doesn't know about Moses and splitting the Red Sea? Like, we all know that, but do we really? And I felt that way growing up, too. Before I was saved, I felt that way with one particular story. I felt like everywhere I went, I kept hearing this story. I saw movies about it. I saw all this stuff. Um, it was just a cool thing to me. Um, and it was the story of Noah and the flood. Um, and just hearing about this story kind of puts you in awe. Like, we, we probably know the basics, right? We know there's a man named Noah. God told him to build a big, big boat. There was a lot of water that's about to go ahead and flood the earth, and he has to go ahead and, and get on this boat, and he's this old jolly man, he has his family, and then he has two of every animal. Like, we know the basics. We go ahead and, and write down a bullet point on the side of a paper, and we could write that down. I was like, yeah, look, look, I told you I know the story. Um, but if that's all we write, if that's all we say about the story of Noah and the flood and the ark, um, I'm here to tell you, you don't know the story. You think you do, but you have no idea. Um, Alex is going to go and play a video. In fact, um, it's so cool, right before we press play, it's so cool, um, this, this idea of this art that people all over the world try to go ahead and, and, and duplicate it somehow. So, like, there's a movie. I don't know if you guys know. Uh, I think it was Russell Crowe. Was it Russell Crowe? Yeah, yeah, I don't know if anybody saw it. But just, just me, when I saw the trailer, I was like, yo, this is cool. And I've always been a person said, yo, Hollywood, 
there's a bunch of uh, dope movies that you can just make out of this. Like, like really, really like dope stuff that like if, if you put it in theaters, I promise people are going to go and watch. And obviously they did the movie. I know that they kind of had like some, some weird stuff going on in the movie too, but it was, it was a cool thing. And they wanted to go ahead and showcase it because it's a cool thing. Like, like look at this man, he's building this arc and, and people weren't believing him. Then he's on the boat and all this stuff, riding stuff. Um, there's actually this man in the Netherlands though, he's a Dutchman, and he actually built an arc. Um, and we're going to watch this video real quick. I want you guys to see this. Hey there, Carson. We're walking along the coast of Holland and what you're what's right here is very hard to understand until you see it full scale. It is a replica of Noah's Ark built to biblical proportions and religious or not. It is a sight to behold. It all came to Johan Hoibers in a dream. I dreamed that a part of Holland was flooded. And it was a nightmare. A nightmare that inspired him to fulfill his destiny, building his own version of Noah's Ark. Beam by beam, all by hand, and entirely out of beechwood. It is so big that we have to use just a little bit of camera magic to get the entire thing into frame. It basically looks like a city block floating on the water. All made of wood. All made of wood, yeah. How many trees? Yeah. 14,000. <laughs> Three stories high, 75 feet wide, and longer than a football field. Rob Dykesman was one of just five guys who helped put Johan's Ark together. What would it feel like to be on, on the ocean? It's a big ship. I will be scared, at, but I will feel safe at the same time. But this is now, not then. Here, the waters are calm, and some of the animals are plastic. After all, there are some stories that are better left to the imagination. All right, so uh, I'm not sure if you guys knew that. That's crazy, yo. That's crazy. Like, and it was only like five of them, they said. Five guys, like, what, 40,000 trees? That's what it is. 40,000 trees, and, uh, and he even said, and, and there's a longer interview than that, he was like, um, yeah, man, all the measurements in, in the Bible, like, you know, I just took it out. Um, but he thinks it's cool. He thinks, he, he thinks it's cool. And, um, I'm not sure where he's at theologically, but, uh, but even the news reporters right after they were like, man, that's, that's awesome. Like, like how cool would it have been to be Noah and stuff like that? And I'm like, man, I, you didn't read the story. <laughs> you didn't read the story. Um, cause nobody would think that, um, Fascinating. The famous story of Noah and the flood, it fills Sunday school classes. That's one of the stories that we go ahead and we start sharing to our, our kids as, as, when they're very, very young. Uh, you see Christian art about it. The depictions are always the same. A bunch of cute little zoo animals on a boat, captained by a jolly old man, sun shining over his head, clouds puffier than cotton candy. If you had no backstory, you might think Noah loaded up some exotic animals to tour the Atlantic Ocean. However, that's not what it is, and I'm here to tell you that if that's all you think about when you hear the story of Noah, ladies and gentlemen, you missed the point. Follow me. At its core, at its core, this story, and remember this church, please remember this. When you think about Noah and the flood and the ark, this story is about God's awesome and terrifying anger and wrath towards sinners. That's not a popular topic to talk about. God's love takes the center stage. Uh, God's purpose for your life takes the center stage. Your prosperity takes the center stage. When we go ahead and we walk into churches and we, we get, hey, what do you want to hear from this book? What do you want me to talk about for you? Like, what, what do you want the most? Uh, but we would be doing you a disservice here at Faith Endeavor if we did not preach the entirety of the Bible and we did not preach it accurately. This story is God's anger and wrath towards sinner. Guys, he floods the entire earth. Like, like, let that sink in. He floods the entire earth. Everything moving, everything breathing is going to stop breathing once he accomplishes all of this. That's not something that you just go ahead and paint a bunch of cute little zoo animals, put it in a boat, say, yeah, he got two of every kind. And look at this old man. And he did all this stuff and he trusted God. That's true. But you're missing the point as to why all of this was occurring. 
Real people died, real sin was punished in a real flood by a real God. This is not some myth. I know a lot of people believe that the stories in the Old Testament are just some stuff that's like, ah, nah, you know what? I mean, you can't really go ahead and take that literal. Uh, Pastor and I was actually uh, getting ice cream with a brother and we were talking to him and he was, he was saying this. He was saying, hey, I don't think that the story of Noah really happened. I don't think the flood really happened, even though geology, I mean, even though um, archaeologists have, have said all over the world that, listen, there is proof on every continent that a flood occurred. Like, that's not up for debate. But this gentleman was sitting across from us. He was sitting across from Pastor and I, and he was telling us, he was like, look, I just think that there's a bigger moral to the story. And it's like, hey, you know what? Um, and I forgot what he was saying. He was, just, he was like, you know, it's just whatever you take from it. But a flood didn't really happen. A boat wasn't really built. A lot of people do that. This is not a legend. This is not a myth. This is, this is historical documents. That's what this is. This really happened, like it has names, it has, it has measurements. There's specifics in here. Like, like you don't do that, you don't do that with fables. You don't write a fable and say, hey, like the measurements were this and that, and then you know, this person had to do this and he had gopher wood. And, like you don't, do, you don't do that, no one talks like that. Especially not, not at this time. And so, um, a lot of people believe that. Uh, here's another here's another thing. Um, if you didn't, if you if you forget that this is real people, real sin, a real flood by a real God, uh, what you tend to do, you start saying that you start making this excuse because you, you start reading the story. You like I, 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 if you tell people that God did this, they're not going to want to go ahead and serve God. So what they do, they say, oh, that's the God of the Old Testament. That's, that's the old, this is, we're, we're in the new test, we're, we're in the new covenant, we're, we're this, and I'm like, no, 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 you don't get to go ahead and pick and choose what you want from God. You pick and choose what you want from the Bible, it's not God who you want to serve, it's you who you want to serve. If you miss the judgment, that's what this, that's what this story is about, judgment. If you miss the judgment, you would think Noah and his family just took a carnival cruise. Hey, look, we were just in uh, uh, Key West and we were looking at the we were looking at the big boats and um, and I and I've never been on a cruise. So every time I get near a cruise, I, I, start, I start talking to my wife. I'm like, Kelly, tell me a little bit more about it. She's like, yeah, there's like that. You know, you got you got this big slide. I'm like, the slide is on the on, on the boat. It's like, yeah, and you can play basketball. I was like, wait, wait, you can play basketball on a cruise like like while it's in the water. Like, I'm just amazed. I can only imagine like with the art, right? You're like, yo, what? Like, look how look how giant that is. Um, now, here's, here's another thing, right? Like you start thinking like, man, okay, cool. They were flooding, God's flooding the earth because there were some terrible things happening at that time. Um, now were there terrible sins being committed? Yes. And we're going to talk about that in a little, but God is punishing them who commit terrible sins. I mean, and God is punishing them who's committed terrible sins, but do not think that those sins are terrible only in this text, you have to understand that there was terrible sins that were being punished for that weren't even done with their hands yet. God is punishing them for their hearts. You see, it's easy for us to spot the evil in other people's lives. But when we have to address the sin in our own lives, oh, that gauge is broke. Like, like it's working perfectly when I have to see it in everybody else's life. Yeah, look at her. Look at him. They're not supposed to be doing that. But when it's time to go ahead and reflect on my own sin, it's tough for me to do that. Ask yourself, why do other people's sins bother you more than your own? You're with, it with, you're, 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 you're with yourself 24-7. <laughs> if anyone should not like you, it's you. Because we always think our sin is small and everybody else's is huge. Here's the reality. Not only were the murderers, people committing adultery, thieves, all these, all these, the, the, the rapists, like not only were they dealt with, but also the ones who thought their sins were small. I guarantee you there were religious people drowning. Both groups drowned. Why? Because God is holy. 
So do not assume when we start reading this that only the serial killer was outside of the door of the ark when the waters began to rise. No, 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 no. Grandmothers were out there too. The nice business owner from around the corner who never hurt anyone, he was drowning too. The young lady with the beautiful smile, she drowned too. Why? Because if you're not putting your trust in God, all sin is the same. Because sin is not something you just do. It is who you are. And you have to see that. If you miss that, if you miss the judgment, you will not appreciate the salvation that God gives in this story. I can tell you about an ark all day, but it does not matter if you do not see yourself as one who was supposed to be outside of the ark. God is holy. And sin is like oil. It only takes one drop to spark up the flames of God. But even though God did execute judgment because people refused to forsake sin, he still showed grace to those who trusted in him. Open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter six. We're going to hop around. So, so it's three chapters, three chapters that we essentially have to go ahead and touch on. I'm not going to touch on every single verse, but we're going to go get we're going to get the gist of the story. And we're going to understand exactly how this story and you always want to ask this question, whatever you're reading is like, man, how does this point to Jesus? Because if I just stop as Noah was like, man, look, guys, you have to be like Noah. Uh, well, don't stop at chapter eight, read chapter nine and see if you still want to be like Noah. Like, like, here's the thing, like you cannot just go ahead and create this sermon and say, hey, uh, uh, you have to be obedient like Noah. And then if you're obedient, like, look, God's going to God's going to go ahead and fulfill his promise to you. A lot of pastors go ahead and preach that text like that, but that's not what this text is talking about. You have to ask, answer this question. How is this text pointing to Jesus? What is this text telling me about Jesus? And that's what this sermon is about. That's what this sermon is about. Jesus is the better ark. Genesis chapter six. Let's look at this. Verses one through six. We're going to read this. Uh, When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, were attractive. And they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward where the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. So real quick, there's two different theories right here. I'm not going to go ahead and tell you which one one I kind of hold on to. But um, there's two different things. One, that either that these were fallen angels. this This is how demonic this time was. Fallen angels who were coming down. And sleeping with daughter with with women, and 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 this is what was what, what was happening. Or it was the the offspring of Seth. And so I'm not really sure. I mean, either way, what we know though is that sin is is happening here. God is angry at what's occurring. And the Bible says here in verse four that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, that where the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Highlight that. This is is what's provoking God right here. Verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention, he doesn't just say act, your intentions are evil. He says every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, like, like, like you have to understand, it's like, do people really just only do evil all day, right? Like you walk outside, you're like, nah. Like even though this dude is an atheist and he hates God, I see him walking an old lady across the street. But it's not your actions that God is judging. Primarily, he's not. It's the, it's the motive behind it. So anything outside of the glory of God, God is going to look down and say, that's not good. I can't claim that as good. There's a different, different rubric that I'm using altogether. 
um, verse 6. So he sees all of that. Check this out. Check this out. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Let me stop right here and help you understand what's being said because you might run into people that say, aha, you serve God, but look, he made a mistake. He said, he just said he regretted. You only regret something when you make a mistake, right? Like there's no way you go ahead and serve a, I thought your God is perfect. He, he, he made a mistake and he's grieving right now? Says that he grieved him in his heart? That's the God you serve? So what's being used here is this thing called anthropomorphism. Okay, I know it's a big word, but understand this. It's called anthropomorphism. It's basically when you go ahead and attach humanly attributes, humanly language, to go ahead and describe what God is doing. He's, there's, there's no way. I don't know of a way to go ahead and really communicate to you how God saw something, he hated it, and now he has to act upon it. I have to use some sort of language for you to understand that. And the best that we can do is regret and grieve. But obviously... And, and what I'm not going to do, I'm not going to take this verse and then ignore every other verse in the Bible that constantly and consistently displays the sovereignty and perfection of God and say, all right, well, cool, well, look at this. This is an anthropomorphism. This is, this is the best that we can do to go ahead and communicate to everyone exactly what's going on. I have to go ahead and use specific words to help you understand the severity of what's going on at this time. And this is the best that we can do. Look at verse seven and eight. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Again, look at this last verse in eight, verse eight. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, um, it's going to go ahead and say that like Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Here's the problem. Many, many, many children, Bible story books, um, especially when we tell this story, um, they're going to go and say, hey, people everywhere was bad, but Noah was good. So be good. Be good, people. But no, Noah was good, not because he wasn't bad, but because he was believing in the good one whom his father had promised. You have to understand, this is all a part of the plan in Genesis 3. When the fall happened, after everything went to shambles because Adam and Eve eats the fruit, God promises them, hey, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. I'm going to follow that line. And since Noah is in this lineage, I'm going to go ahead and spare his family. He had faith in me. He was trusting me. But he wasn't, it wasn't because Noah had it all together. And we're going to see, or we're not going to see it today in the sermon, but if you keep reading the story, you're going to find out quick that Noah was just as wretched as everybody else. But he's putting his trust in God. The text in Genesis says that the world got so bad, so much demonic chaos that God saw it and basically was like, I'm going to hit the reset button. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all of this. In the midst of that worldly chaos, there is something, though, that I do want to go ahead and bring about Noah. I don't want to just go and say, like, ah, look, don't look at Noah, but, it, but, but there is something to be said. In the midst of all that worldly chaos, in the midst of all that sin around him, he continues to be obedient to God. That's, that's powerful. That's powerful. You see in verse 8, it says, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I can't imagine what it was like for Noah to try to remain faithful during this time. Not to the extent of wickedness that was like, like, like think about it. Think about all the stuff that was probably at the, at the tips of his hands that he could have indulged in. And he's putting his head down and he's making this ark and he's being, obe he's being obedient to God. With all this sin around him, can you imagine what it was like for him to be the only one that wants to go ahead and serve God while everyone around you is saying, nah, we're not interested in that. Does anybody in here understand what that's like? 
I mean, we get glimpses of it on earth, right? Where you have to remain faithful while everybody else is doing whatever they want. Some of us can't remain faithful if a bottle of alcohol is in front of us, let alone all of this other stuff. Some of us can't remain faithful if we have a lot. If you give me a large amount of money, my faithfulness goes out the window. So, of course, we can't imagine what Noah was going through because we don't even fight against a small fraction of that. But for some of you, though, in your work environment, you might be the only one that care about the things of the Lord. God sees that. And he's finding favor in that. There's no one around you who cares about, th- who cares about the things of the Lord. And yet you are, you are there and you are continuing to be a light. Maybe, maybe. Like for me, I wasn't saved in high school. But man, I remember this, this kid. His name was Gio. And um, he was leading a Bible study every day. No, I didn't know the gospel. I didn't know anything. All I knew, I, I, if you ask me, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I believe in God. I knew God was real. I didn't really know about Jesus. I didn't, I didn't know too much like that. But I remember walking through the halls and I used to see this dude all the time. I wish I could find him today. But, um, but I, I used to just watch him, man. And, and he didn't care. He would do a Bible study every day at lunch. You know, some people would walk in um, and hear him. And um, he would have his Bible with him all the time. And I would just be like, yo, like, all these fine women around here, bro. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, like that's what, you, that's what you're doing during lunch? You know what I'm saying? Like, man, like all, 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 these, like, all these school dances you could come to, bro. Like, you need to come, you know what I'm saying? Like, you need to come to the football games. Like, we, like, like, it, it, like, like he wasn't trying to partake in, all, in none of that, though. He found something at the young age of what? what maybe he was like 16, 17 years old. I was a little younger, so I was like 14, 15. Like, like he, at that age, he had already found, he already knew, like, yo, Jesus is better. And that's in the midst of darkness. Like, like how dark can you get than high school? <laughs> like, I, I don't know about child, but it was bad where I was at. And so, in the midst of all that, man, he's remaining faithful. Or maybe, okay, cool, we talked about work, we talked about school. Uh, maybe it's your family. And because you're a follower of Christ, you have some strong convictions that cause you not to be okay with certain things that your family partakes in. Or when conversations come up, you are vocal about your stance on godliness and they don't like that, which has caused some friction in your relationship with your mother, with your father, with your brother, with your cousin, whoever it is. And yet you are remaining faithful. God sees that and he find, and he's finding favor in you. Do not think that it is in vain. Like, like Noah wasn't the cool guy. He wasn't that, like, you right. Like, he wasn't the guy on the scene, like, where everybody else was living it up. He's just being obedient, and he's letting them know, look, there's, there's a flood coming. They're laughing at him. He's preaching to them. Listen, God's wrath is coming. It's going to get bad, and I'm building this, I'm building this ark. And no one is, is listening. So I, so I do, like I said, I, although I, although I kind of despise where you just make Noah the main antagonist and hit the, the main, the main uh, character in this story, um, there is something to be said about Noah's obedience and Noah's faithfulness here. It should not be underestimated. He stands tall in the pocket and comes through for God. The world is so wicked that God is only communicating with one individual, and it's Noah. That's crazy. Jump down to verse 13 for me. Um, it says this, and God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So he tells Noah he's going to destroy them. This is how bad the world is. Look at verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Here's the crazy part. God hasn't even told Noah how he's going to destroy the earth. All he said was, I'm going to destroy the earth, and this is what you have to go ahead and create. In fact, you want to know what the literal translation would have said? This is what Noah would have heard. This is God. This is the literal translation for ark. He would have said, hey, Noah, I need you to build, I need you to make a box. 
That's what Noah heard. You and I, we hear ark, right? And we automatically translate it to a big boat because that's what Noah built. But, but that, 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 the Hebrew word for ark would have just been box. That's literally, it's the same word used to describe what Moses was placed in as a baby and floated down the Nile. The same exact word. So when God tells him, hey, I'm going to destroy the earth, Noah's like, okay, all right, what do you need me to do? Make a box. Uh, okay. Is there like a gun in the box? Is there like, like, like do I protect myself? Like what, what exactly? God hasn't even told Noah what he's going to do yet. Build a box and Noah, not perfect, but obedient, has faith to trust God and is going to do it. You know it's sad because the world dismisses this story because it's just too outrageous, right? Like they, they hear that like, yo, what? He's building a what? Like I said, there will be specifics here. God is going to be specific when he tells God, I mean, he tells Noah what to create. And Noah doesn't get the explanation until verse 17. Check this out. Verse 17, chapter 6. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. This is why you need a box, Noah. This is why you need a box. I'm going to flood the earth. Essentially, that ark is going to be 400 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Why does the ark have to be huge? Well, obviously, you guys know the story, right? He's going to go ahead and get um, animals all on this ark. God is going to draw them here. It's going to be 120 years before God actually makes good on that promise on flooding the earth. 120 years. And you best believe during the 120 years, he's being laughed at. He's being mocked. He's probably even having questions. Day in and day out, Noah is putting this box together. And the Bible says that Noah obeys God. Um, Then in chapter 7, you guys go down to chapter 7. Like I said, we're bouncing. We're we're getting the gist of it. So go down to chapter 7 for me. Uh, Chapter 7, Noah Or God tells Noah to take his family into the ark and that in seven days he will make it rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And after the seventh day, look what starts to happen. Go down to verse 11 and 12 in chapter 7 for me. Verse 11 and 12 in chapter 7. It says this, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were open. So check this out. One of the ways that the Lord floods the earth is not just by raining. Waters burst up from the ground. That's one of the ways that the Lord floods the earth. And me and you really can't really like wrap our minds exactly what this looks like. But just try. Try to fathom like what this was looking like. And rain is coming down, water is coming up, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So that's one way he flooded the earth, and everything that is breathing is taking its final breath. God is so angry at the sin that was being committed. God is so angry At the hearts of man, the intentions of man. Like if you miss this, if you miss this, you miss the whole point. Sin is not something that you and I should just go ahead and just try to like sweep under the rug. Like you come before God and listen, here's the beautiful part. Someone has already paid that price for you. But you have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge what is being done and why this had to be done. I hate, one of the things I hate is when people say, God could have saved you anyway, but he loves you so much he sent his only begotten son. Listen, I'm here to tell you, if God could have saved you another way, he would not have sent his son to die, his only son to die. It was the only way to save you. 
The cross is not a measurement of how much I'm loved. The cross is a measurement of how much he hates sin. That's what the cross is like. Like, like it was he hates sin. He has to send his son to die. You are, 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 are making light of things that have pierced Jesus in the side that placed the crown of thorns on his head, that had men spitting in his face, his best friends denying him. I don't know who that guy is. And here you get a glimpse of it. You get, man, sin. God hates it so much. Anything contrary. And you have to understand, like, you, you can't just look like, man, look, God, you didn't have to do all that. Yes, he did. That was the, in fact, if he didn't do all that, he would have been inconsistent with his character because God is holy. Check this out. Because God is holy. The only logical response is for him to destroy anything that is not holy. I tell you this all the time. Your biggest problem is that God is holy and you are not. And maybe that word holy gets thrown around too much that we kind of diluted it. It just doesn't carry its same weight. It just doesn't carry the same weight. Men who used to write the name Yahweh would go only use one pen for each letter. They wouldn't even put the vowels in it. They, like, they, they was, it was so much reverence towards it. In the early church, when they would pray, they would have this thing called a posture of prayer because they knew who they were talking to. You and I, when we say pray, we just kind of just put our head down, might keep our eyes. I mean, I'm not saying that you, I'm not trying to be religious and say, hey, you have to do this. I'm just saying that it's only until now that we just assume that body language doesn't communicate anything. They did. They knew I'm talking to, I'm talking to the, to the holy of holies. Like my whole body wants to go ahead and reflect to God right now that I know who he is. And here you see exactly what's going on, man. Noah and his family were on the ark for a total of 370 days. Go down to verse 15 for me. Verse 15 and 16. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded them. And check this out. These next six words. And the Lord shut him in. Boom. The door locks. Noah doesn't do that. Noah no longer has an option to open or close the door of the ark. There's only one door. There's only it, 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 the specific. There was a specific way to create this ark. One of the specific things that he had to do, God said, I want one door on that ark. There's going to be one way to get on this ark. And it got to a point where he shuts it. Why couldn't Noah just lock the door? Why is it written that God shut him in? This is why. I'm just going ahead and read these next couple of verses. I'm going to talk to you, right? Look at verse 17. We're going to go to verse 17 to 24 in chapter 7. Follow me. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. You want to know why he shut that door? The day of salvation had came to an end. You best believe 
as the waters are rising, people are banging on the door. Okay, I believe now. Okay, just, just let me in. I, I, I finally understand. You know what, everything you were trying to preach to me for, for, for all of these days, like, like for 120 days straight, you've been trying to tell me, okay, cool, just wait, let me go get my friends. Let me, please, just let us get on the ark. You can just put us on the side. We don't even need to get in the suite. I know you probably got some like, like, like good rooms for you and your kids, but please just get, me, like, like just get me on the boat. Just get me on the boat. And it was over. It's too late. Church, how long will you reject the warnings? How long will you reject the promises? How long will you reject the preaching of God's word? The day of salvation will come to an end, and oh my goodness, is it awesome and terrifying. The Bible is clear. You have every right right now to go ahead and say, look, I just don't, I just don't believe it, cool then let's stop playing church. Then let's stop, let, let's, let's stop, let's stop playing around because like, like if you don't understand, like I, I've, I've lost plenty of friends that are like, look bro, I just don't like the way that you just on me. Like, like, like let me just do, all right, cool. That's fine. But understand, I love you. And there's a reason why it's because I, I, cause, 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 cause I don't think that this is a lie. That's why. Like, if you don't see me harassing you, then you have to question, like, bro, do you really believe that? You all, you all would look at me outside if a little girl was standing in the middle of the road and I saw a semi-truck coming and she did not see this truck and I just watched that truck hit that little girl. You all would look, you're an evil man. You could have done something about it, but you didn't. You could have screamed that. You could have told her. You could have grabbed her. And well, even if she was kicking, she just wants to play in the street. She doesn't see the truck coming. She just wants to have a good time. You all will look at me and say, Los, you're evil. That's the same reason. Same reason why, why Mar Pastor Marcio is here day in and day out. Like, you don't think it's, it's, it'll be easier for him? to not have to worry about several people and, 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 and opening this church and making sure the lights are on and, and studying week in and wait. You don't think it's easier for him to just go ahead and spend his time with his wife and, 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 uh, and, and his daughter? Of course, but he knows that there's, there's something more. There's something more important. Their salvation will come to an end. I just want to uh, look at this verse. I, I think this on it. Luke 17, verses 26 through 30. This is what Jesus says. Check this out. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. Jesus, look, man, Jesus is, is and, and this is how beautiful the Bible is. It comes full circle. It comes full circle. That's why I said you don't stop at the story of Noah and just think that's all the story was about. Jesus is letting you know what the story was about. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rain from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. He's letting you know. There's a final wrath coming. God gave specifics in building the ark. And he told Noah to build one door on the vessel. That one door led to him and his whole family being saved from destruction. Um, as Frankie comes up here, I want to go ahead and close with this. Uh, Noah is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. And if you, if you read the book of Hebrews chapter 11, you know about this. There's this thing called the hall of faith, right? Like, I mean, this one little subtitle we give it, right? A bunch of, a bunch of men and women in the Old Testament that, that the writer of Hebrews highlights and lets you know like, yo, there's some people who walked this walk before you. One of the people he mentions is Noah. He says this, by faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events has yet, as yet unseen in reverent fear, 
constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You just read the story. It's no shock why Noah's there. And in fact, all the people that's mentioned in Hebrews 11, you and I could go ahead and pinpoint it's like, yo, she shouldn't be there, he shouldn't be there. Like, like, like they all jacked up. But that's why they're not the main character. It's not about them. They're pointing to a better savior. It wasn't about Moses. There's a better Moses coming. It wasn't about Abraham. It's a better Abraham. It's not about the ark. There's going to be a better ark coming, a final one. Here's the good news. You just saw all this destruction. You saw all of the turmoil, all of the pain, all of the death. You just read about it. God hated sin. And I said, the only way you will appreciate salvation is if you understand the judgment. That's the only way. I can tell you all day, look, I got the cure for cancer. But you don't really, you don't really care unless I'm going to split the money with you. But you don't really care I got the cure for cancer unless I first tell you, you have cancer running through your body right now and you have six months to live and if you don't do something about it you will die i have the cure for cancer now you're gonna now you're gonna hold on to it ask yourself what have you been holding on to some of us have been, and, 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 and like I said, you missed the point if you say, oh, look, man, oh, yo, they were just like sleeping around and getting drunk. I'm not doing none of that. I told you, the whole earth flooded. Noah was the only one on the boat with his family. Who in the world do you think was drowning? Just the murderers? It was the people who thought they had it all together. Day in and day out, they thought they were just regular good people and God is saying, nah. You can go ahead and think you're a good person, but until you put your trust in me, you won't be saved. You will not be saved on your own admission. The problem though, oh, so here's the good news. Genesis chapter eight, verse one. Out of all of that, out of all of, of this, this is ruckus. Check this out. Noah must have been terrified on his boat, but he's trusting in the promise, right? He built this box and he's in this box. And the Bible says, chapter eight, verses one, probably the most beautiful words that Noah can understand. It says this, but God remembered Noah. I told you, for those of you who are saying, man, you know what? This trust in Jesus thing isn't necessarily working out for me financially. This trust in Jesus thing isn't working out for me relationally why like this trust in Jesus thing isn't working out for me um, uh, with my health like why aren't all these things getting better J understand God is remembering you God will remember you the problem though is that Noah's ability to build an ark and survive the flood didn't include any power to escape the corruption of his own heart Noah survived the flood, but he has not survived the final wrath yet. Noah, that ark couldn't save Noah for all eternity. They weren't just sinners outside of the boat. They were sinners inside of the boat. And like I said, if you keep reading the story, you'll know, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The Lord's going to give them a command, hey, be fruitful and multiply. He's going to give that same command to Noah. And sin is going to reign in this world because they are sinners. You need someone to come in and start a new creation. The flood didn't end the sin problem. They needed, there needed to be another Noah story that didn't end in sin or curses. One that would conclude with consistent obedience, salvation, and a guarantee that water judgment would never be needed again. Wooden nails would be used again, but this time it would be used for a better ark. 
a cross. While a wooden ark delivered Noah from physical death, a wooden cross delivers us from spiritual death. It's coming full circle, y'all. Just as Noah obeyed God by climbing onto a boat to save a few, Jesus obeyed the Father by climbing onto a cross to save many. Amen? Like, 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 like this has to, if this isn't impacting you, check for a pulse. Like this means a lot. Jesus Christ became the man Adam chose not to be and the man Noah never could be. Adam was born without sin, but chose to sin. Noah was born into sin and could never escape it. Jesus is the only man to accomplish what we need. Listen to this. If you were here two weeks ago when we did the Christmas service, when we were talking about Luke chapter 2, the angels come and they let them know, listen, unto you a child is born, one who is going to be a savior. Because that's what we need. If we needed to be educated, he would have sent us a teacher. If we needed advice, he would have sent us a counselor. If, he needed, if we needed something else, he, he would have sent that. But you know what you need? You need your sin taken care of. That's why he sent a savior. That's, right. That's why he sent a savior. And Noah is trusting in God that, yeah, I'm going to build this ark because one day you're going to go ahead and send a better ark, one that will take away, away all this sin. The ark also signifies the grave. He was enclosed in darkness and went through the waters, Noah, to symbolize Jesus who went through the waters of death on the cross. It's funny because the mode in which Jesus died, suffocation on the cross, points to drowning as well. Jesus drowning in water rises out of the waters like Noah rose out of the waters. At the end of the story, Noah sends out a dove if you guys know the end of the story, he sends out a dove. He has to do it about three times. The first time, nothing. The second time, he comes back with... To let you know, like, hey, the flood is over. And then the third time, the dove doesn't come back. Let's you know, like, hey, okay, there's land. And if the dove does not return, like I said, the, that means the land is ready and the flood is over. But as we all know in the Bible, scriptures, right, a dove, it signifies what? The Holy Spirit. And the dove hovered over the waters, pointing to Noah, look, new creation. Just as the Spirit hovered over the waters in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. When Jesus was baptized, what descended over Jesus? A dove hovered over the waters. He was baptized into the Jordan, which points to the Old Testament entrance into the new land. Jesus is bringing about a new creation through a greater exodus. Guys, understand if you miss anything in this story today, here's the final theme. Jesus is the better ark. You do not read Genesis chapter 6, verse through chapter 6 through chapter 8 and just say, oh, look, that's a cool story. Late till I tell my kids about it. No, you have to finish it. Bring it full circle. Jesus is the better ark. Guys, the wrath of God is coming. It's real. And the door is shutting. I'm going to say that again. Pay attention. The wrath of God is coming. It's real. And the door is shutting. And Jesus has two hands, one hand holding back the wrath of God and the other hand, come home, come get on the ark, get on the ark. And one day, both of his hands will drop. Jesus. And you can never say that you never knew. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, every single person in this room needs to come to realization that you are real. You are serious when it comes to your creation. You have created this world and sin has distorted it all. 
but you are so beautiful, you are so powerful, God, that sin never gets the last laugh. Satan never gets the last word. You have placed stories in this book to remind us of how from the beginning you've been promising us that you will do away with all sin, oh God. Let this story of Noah be one that does frighten us a little bit. It does kind of nudge us a little bit, oh God. That tomorrow could be the last day for all of us. And that if we do not get on this ark, we will not be saved. If we do not trust in you, Jesus, we will not be saved. You are the ark. And while we were supposed to be outside of the ark drowning, you did that for us. Because on the cross, you became the perfect substitute. You did for us what we could not do for ourselves, and that was to atone. That was to pay the price for all the crimes that we've committed against a holy God. Jesus, you did that. And the life of obedience that you lived perfectly, you gave to your people and your people's life that has been filled with constant disobedience. You have taken that, oh God. That's what makes Jesus so beautiful. Let everybody in this room not wait another day. They do not wait another week, another month, another year. 2020 is here, but man, it, nothing, nothing is promised. A lot of promises you've given us. You, 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 you placed that rainbow after the flood to promise that you would never flood the earth again, oh God, but you have never made a promise about tomorrow. Let us all understand that. We need you constantly because we are, 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 are still sinners, oh God. We believe. Help our unbelief. Nothing in our hands we bring, simply to the cross we cling. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.